Look at this. So usually those ink pumps, I'd have two or four channels, meaning two or four pumps, but this one only has one. Hey, what's up, Reefers? I don't know why I never filmed with my gimbal because Dude, it's so easy. Before I was trying to stack boxes, put a camera on, now I just slap it on the gimbal, um, aim it, and good to go. Damn, after all these years, right? So today I want to update you a little bit about the 10 gallon budget nano tank. So the budget bill is pretty much done. All the equipment you need is included in the $146 budget. You can run a totally successful reef of it. So for the past couple months, I have been letting it just mature and running. I did cheat a little bit though. So instead of adding bucket of water every two or three days to keep the water level the same, so the salinity does not swing, I hooked up a Spare Smart ATO, that's an auto top off system to the tank. So what it does is that it will monitor the water level and as soon as it dip a little bit, it will pump some new uh, fresh water in. But again, this is not a required equipment. Um, I was half, well, not happily. I was just using a little cup and adding fresh water to the tank every two or three days. But that got old pretty fast, obviously. And I do have this spare ATO around, so I just kind of hooked it up after I think like two months of just dumping water in. And if you stay to the end, I also talk about some of the equipment I've been using, like this uh, Flipper Nano LG Magnet, as well as equipment that I plan to add to this budget build, like this world's smallest dosing pump. Dude, how cute is this? And I plan to start dosing chopping marines off a reef and I'll explain why a little bit later in the video and again all these things are totally not necessary you probably don't even need to do too much if you're just keeping a little bit of corals but I plan to stock this tank full of coral that's why I'm looking into a single channel dosing pump as well as uh, some kind of supplements to keep the level steady so without further ado let's go on with the update Hey, what's up reefers? It has been close to two months since I last talked about the nano tank. Figure it's about time I give you guys a proper update. So let's get right to it. Now the first thing you may see is this nice rose bubble tip anemone and this is the one I picked up from my good friend Alex. Flashback. All right, so I'm with Alex, my good, good friend and dealer. <laughs> dealer <laughs> when it comes to Rose Purple Tip Anatomy, he, as you can see, he has a huge tank full of these. And these are the exact same clone that I got in the 45 gallon tank, and he has been just hooking me up. Um, so he's gonna hook me up with another one for the 10 gallon. He actually gave me one, but unfortunately got sucked into the intake. So here's for try number two. So as you can see, this tank is pretty much dedicated to Rose Purple Tip Anatomy. Not intentionally, but for some reason, they just really, really like the environment that Alex provided them with. And he does not dose anything special, water change every like what, like few months? Every few months. And feed reef chili once a week. Um, that's pretty much it. And they loved it. And the light just turned on. Otherwise all of them will kind of just fill out the entire tank. It's ridiculous. So one cool character is this clownfish right here. Turns out, I didn't even know, this was a uh, this was the little guy from my old 65 gallon tank like at least 10 years ago and Alex just took her in and gave her a great home and here she is and she actually beat up a maroon clown it's insane because like I thought maroon clown's the one of the meanest fish out there but apparently Isan Hayo Isan Go there you go much faster I was expecting to be here for like half an hour <laughs> pretty good at this Dang. nice Great size for the tank gallon. Any tip for people who wanna really grow their Boba Tip Anatomy collection? Actually, I try to feed them shrimp, frozen shrimps. Yeah. So, and don't touch them. Don't touch them, right? Just kinda let them go? Let them go. And we've just been here for about, what, like 15, 20 minutes and things are slowly you know, opening up. End of flashback. For some reason, it just keeps multiplying f for him. Uh, which kind of benefit all his friends because uh, we, we, every time we need a roast with him, we just go up to him and be like, Hey man, you got any extras? He always said, yes, I got you, come by. Um, so there we go, this guy's doing really well. I've been feeding him maybe once a week or so with some of the uh, LLS frozen food, some of the larger chunks. I just kind of put it in the tentacles and it would just pour it into the mouth. Now, since we're talking about anatomy, right there we'll see the Bally Mini Max anatomy. It has moved from here all the way up there. Uh, I guess it found this perfect spot right there. I could probably say the same about this little guy right here too. This is the guy that used to be over here and it is somehow migrated all the way to the corner of the tank and it has stayed there ever since. Now looking up a little bit, we see the Kryptonite Candy Cane. This is the nice colony that started dying back viciously. Uh, in the 45 gallon tank, 
If you remember, the 45 gallon tank went through a one-two punch. Uh, the first first punch being a serious elk swing. Second punch being the uh, temperature dropped to 70 to 72 for about three days uh, because I did not realize that the heater was not plugged in. It was like a serious mistake. Uh, so the whole colony died back. I was able to get like two or three frags out of it, and this is one of them. But thankfully, this one seems to be really happy, and uh, one of the heads seems to be splitting as well. So that is the good news. Now swinging over here, we see the frog spine continues to do well. For some reason, I just have good luck with frog spawn in general. I can't say the same for all the euphilias, but frog spawn, yep, got it in the back. So this guy is happy and uh, puffy. Now over here, we got the purple tip green hammer that I picked up for, from a fellow Walmart member. It's pretty much holding steady. It's not doing too much. Uh, so I can't really say too much of it. I wish the color is a little bit more contrasty, but for now, I think it's a nice way to kind of uh, have something to fill in the space. Um, now coming down a little bit here, we see the remnants of the gold torch. I actually left the skeleton in just so I could talk about it. Um, it has not been happy for quite a few months. Um, I just couldn't find a spot that's happy in whether in the 10 gallon tank or the 45 gallon tank. So uh, one day it just simply disappeared. Um, but it is what it is. It seems like a lot of people have been having trouble with gold torch at the one year mark and I am no exception. Uh, so sadly that was that was it. And same thing with the Indigo Torch in my 45 gallon tank. I'm just having trouble finding a perfect spot for it. It just doesn't like something with my tank, whether it's like tank mates or like the water. So I may shy away from Gold Torch for a while, which is a shame because I really like the color. Now in front of it, we got the uh, Green Chi Corals or Green Nephia or something. I mean, I'm terrible at the name, sorry. <laughs> But this has really started growing a lot better in the 10 gallon tank versus in the 45. I think you just really like the flow, like the light and like the placement. So I may, I'll keep it there for a while and see how it does. The Zolas is, has been kind of like on and off. So the, the, the one up here, I think it's either Gobstopper or uh, Devil's Armor. I think it's Gobstopper. Um, there was a Aptasia among the polyps. So I used some Aptasia X. It's time to address the Aptasia in the 10 gallon budget reef right there. I'm using some Aptasia X and I have these from my GSP days. So basically these are just thick. Uh oh, sorry Zoas. So I want to spread, spread these all around the oral disc, but apparently uh, okay, I'm kind of curious what it does to Zoa as well. I've been off, pissed off for the last two months. Uh, now the orange hornet or purple hornet, I don't know what it's called. One of the hornets, right? It's actually doing really well. Uh, I think something must have crawled right on top of it before filming this. So it's semi-closed up. Uh, the one down here is kind of on and off. Sometimes happy, sometimes not. But I think I know the reason. I'll get to it soon. The, I believe this is the uh, space monster. Uh, it's doing really well, except now I see a little bit of Aptasia. Uh, Bob's cousin. If you guys know who Bob is, check out my Instagram. Bob's cousin hanging out there. So this time, I'm not gonna just dose it with Aptasia X. If I am, I'll be really careful. Uh, but since it's such, it's on the side, I'm just gonna pull the plug and just scrape the Aptasia off. Now swinging over here, we see the Pandora Pally. That's doing extremely well. And again, we do see a little bit of Aptasia happening right there. I actually did not notice there's actually two. There used to be one. So I'll try to get those off as well. But these pally grow so fast, they are actually, I got these for really cheap. This whole chunk was like five bucks from one of the frag swap. And the guy was like, you sure you want this? I'm like, what do you mean? Of course. But little did I know how aggressive this is going to grow. And it's actually crawling onto the rock now. Usually this is completely open. And I think uh, because of this aptasia and because of the sexy shrimp crawling all over them, that it closed up a little bit. But for the most part, there's a really healthy colony as, as soon as I address the aptasia problem. Now these sexy shrimp, now these guys are awesome. I picked them up from Rick's at, in Frederick's. Uh, I think they were selling for like four of them for like 40 bucks or something like that. So I picked up four. Uh, I've had them for close to almost like three months now. And um, sometimes uh, I will feed fish flakes, the primary flakes I really like. I'll feed the whole tank, maybe a little pinch. And I'll see these guys like jump right onto the flake to eat them. And I, uh, you know, to my surprise, I, when I feed LRS, I'll try to squirt some towards them, but they do not actually aggressively go after them as they go after the uh, primary flakes. Um, but things may change over time, who knows? 
but I do find them on top of Zoa sometimes, next to LPS sometimes, on top of the uh, Sea and Enemy sometimes, as well as the Bally Mini Max, and they seem to be okay. Now, when I posted this a while back on Instagram, a few of you guys warned me about them possibly uh, predating or eating the Zoa polyps. I have not seen this happen yet, but I'm also really careful in terms of like uh, feeding them, making sure they get enough food to eat. So I feel like as long as they're full, they may not bother the core too much, but hey, you know, only time will tell. Now in terms of snails, I actually lost two snails. So I added, I think I added like four or five snails. Um, I lost two of the smaller snails. Uh, you see, oh, that one is okay. I think I put the shells already. One is Astrius and one is the um, Troca snails. I'm pretty sad about it. But the other snail seems still seems to be okay. Look at this guy right here, big trochus right there. Um, but one thing, actually two things I noticed. Number one, the good news is that I'm starting to see Cal uh, Caroline algae growing on the back wall, on, at least on that intake pipe right there, which is good news. That means that the tank is now stable and um, supports the these kind of like uh, this kind of algae that needs calcium, meaning that the tank health is pretty good. The second thing I noticed. It's actually right there, you see that? The brown rust looking algae. So I believe those are diatoms. So they have been there for close to four weeks now. It started out with a tiny little spot right there if you look back at some of the older videos on my Instagram. Uh, slowly it started um, kind of migrating out here, starting to get a little bit more. Now I attribute this to the amount of food that I'm feeding. Uh, so besides LLS, um, obviously I feed some of the prime reef to the uh, sexy shrimps. And once in a while, I would dose some of these um, uh, reef nutrition products as well, just so that, also reef roy, just so that I make sure that coral have some food to eat as well. It's not straight up, just all from the light. And I, all the combination of that kind of overload the system a little bit. So I'm starting to get a little bit of these uh, diatom algae which is no big deal. It has been like four weeks, it's, it's there and it's fine, easy to remove. But the thing is that if I remove it, right, it doesn't mean that I treated the, the issue. This, these are just symptoms. So what I've been doing, oh, by the way, check this out. You see these, uh, that's the other two sexy shrimp back there, right there. So it's kind of hard to see here because the light is off in the back, but I actually have a little, This so this was the, um, filter intake sponge. When I was traveling, I slipped it onto the intake uh, because uh, the rose bump in enemy was pretty new at that point. I was afraid it's gonna get loose and get sucked into it. Uh, but I don't need this anymore. So I actually shoved some uh, BLS GFOs into here and, st uh, and capped it with some sponge uh, to keep the GFO in here. So I just sank it in here, hoping that it's gonna take away some of the phosphate and in turn address the diatom issue. So we'll see how it goes. We'll give it like a, a week or two and see. I also have some, I also bought some of the fine mash bags that I could put GFO into. Um, so if this doesn't work out, I'll put the mash back in. They'll, uh, they'll kind of like encourage better water flow through and stuff like that. But honestly, I don't think that's a big deal. Or I could just do better water change. <laughs> uh, but look at that guy. And obviously look at that. If you look at the top of the snail shell, we got some bubble algae coming in. Um, which I think it probably come from the 45 since a lot, actually most of these cores come from the 45 gallon tank. Again, LG, not a big deal as long as they kept under wrap. And right here we see the horn is slowly opening back up. Anyways, one thing that I did do is that, um, it's kind of dark, I wish I could turn this light on easily, but it's not, so let's rely on the cameras. Nice AS, uh, ISO. So, I used to have like one heater here. Let's see, where is it? Uh, it's, no, it's this guy right here. So this is a heater I'm using, right? It's a 25 watts uh, high door heater, which is decent, right? For spring, summer, stuff like that. But we have a cold spell in Maryland, um, I think like the last month or two, and this could not keep up. The water temperature was sitting at around, I think like 75 or 76. It couldn't get any higher. I'm trying to do 78. Uh, so I ended up using this extra little heater that I, I had sitting around. This used to be in the uh, reef jar. And this is actually a 50 watts preset heater. I think it's an Equion or something. I just kind of drop it in here. So two heaters with the power combined, they were able to bring the tank temperature back up to a consistent 78 degrees. So that's solid. All right, so that is pretty much it where this tank is sitting. At the moment, I'm still looking for some kind of fish to add to this tank. It will be something small, either like a tiny baby clownfish or some kind of like gobies, I don't know yet. I'm still kind of looking around, keeping my option open. Uh, but in turn, there's actually two little things I want to touch on uh, before I kind of sign off on this piece. This two thing is like, these are two equipment that make my life so much easier when maintaining this tiny tank. 
The first one, you actually heard about it already. You heard, you heard it already. It kind of kicked on. I actually tucked away a auto top off system underneath the AquaClear 70 filter. Uh, so if you look over here, let me move, let me move this towel. You see, I have a water container right here, right? It's hooked up to a auto top off system, and the sensor was actually tucked away right here. If I lift the whole unit, the sensor is right there. Um, this is the Smart ATO Micro. And I used the Smart ATO Nano in the uh, 45 gallon tank, and I used this Smart ATO Micro in the 17 gallon drop off tank. That's why I was sitting around. And I think it costs about like $150. Now, I know this build is a budget build. That's why that's not an essential equipment. Because like as long as you are vigilant in terms of topping water off in this tank, Everything is fine, but I was getting tired of topping water off every two or three days. I was like, okay, I'll give this sitting around, let's just pop it in. It wouldn't make a difference because if you don't have that and you just keep the water topped off, keep the water level consistent, you achieve the exact same results that I do, I do have right now. Um, so again, that is not part of the budget build, but if you want to make your life easier, hey, hey there is the uh, Smart ATO Micro that will fit perfectly within the a quick clear 70. If you guys want more details on this, I'll be happy to do a video that goes more in depth onto where exactly to place it and how I set it up with this container. So it just automatically pump water. So this way I don't need to top off this tank for, I think about every two weeks, I'll top this. This is a five gallon, this is a five gallon container. I top this off every two weeks and it keeps the stability, it keeps the, basically all the levels really stable. Because if you have a lot of salinity swings, like water level keep going down, that means the salt level goes up, right? Because it's less water, then there'll be a swing happening and corals won't be super happy. But as you can see, when things are stable, things are happy. Now the second equipment that I want to talk about that really helped me is this guy right here. This is a flipper nano uh, algae magnet. Now I my glasses quite clean right now. You see some copa pots right here. Uh, so I'm not gonna try to scrape them off, but I, I've been doing that on Instagram and sharing the results and I can probably do one in the future. I will do a proper review on this mag uh, algae magnet, but I just wanna give you guys a quick heads up. Um, <laughs> shit, I just dropped it. <laughs> so what's so great about it is that um, there's two sides. One is a felt pad, right? That's just kind of rub, just rub, rub the uh, soft algae off. And then there's this metal side. And I pretty much just use the metal side almost exclusively. Um, the great thing is about this is that this will take off the Carolina algae so easily and any of the green algae so easily. And the best part is that this kind, it has like a stand off. So it's really difficult for sand to kind of get trapped here. So I used to use like Mac float, right? And basically just kind of like, almost like a Velcro material that scraped the algae away. But what would happen is that some sand would get trapped between the algae magnet and the magnet itself. And I'll go like this and I'll leave scratches. So I have not had that happen yet with these um, flipper. And I guess like it's called flipper because you can really easily maneuver it so that it'll flip from the metal side to the pet sides within the tank without you getting your hand wet and stuff like that. Uh, but honestly, I've just been using a metal side because I like it so much. Um, I'm a huge fan. They have um, quite a bit of cult following. So when I first heard of the um, flippers, I was kind of skeptical. I was like, man, eh, whatever, man. But after I actually tried the one I have in a 45 gallon tank, I bought that one. Um, dude, I, I've, I was a believer. I was going to convert. I was like, dude, this is solid. Uh, so, yep, check it out. Flippers uh, magnet. This is a nano version. I have the regular version downstairs. Big fan, big fan of them. Now, one additional thing that's kind of fun, oh, but look at this sexy shirt right here. Yeah, one additional thing that is kind of fun is that, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, I was trying to keep all the parameters stable, but now that I started adding some of the LPS in there, I do start need to start looking at the water parameters. Um, because I'm kind of lazy, I don't want to like do water change every single week. Um, so I've been doing water change maybe every three weeks or so in this tank. And in the meantime, I've been trying to down in the dosing for this product right here that Mighty Nano Tank turned me on to. This is from Tropic Marine. It's called All for Reef. Uh, so some of you guys may be familiar with dosing two parts to raise alkalinity and calcium and also uh, an, another solution for magnesium separately. But this is a equal part, meaning that you'll raise your alkalinity, calcium and magnesium at the same time. And I think that is perfect for a nano tank like this. Uh, so I'll be... So I have been dosing uh, just kind of haphazardly the last 
two, three months, just randomly at this. And again, if you do regular water change, you do not need to dose anything. It's because I, I'm kind of lazy. <laughs> so I, I did a test on my water level, uh, different water level parameters, and I started dosing this. And I'm trying to dial in to see what kind of level I have. And the reason, and the reason that I'm getting a little bit more, um, I start testing a little bit more trying to determine the level is because I'm so lazy that I plan to hook it up to a small dosing pump right here. This is from Coral Box and it is known as the world's smallest dosing pump. Now this probably deserves its own video by itself because it's such a unique units and unique concept. Uh, but I'll just give you a quick peek right here. If I can pull it out one hand, there it is. Look at this. So usually dosing pumps, I'd have two or four channels, meaning two or four pumps, but this one only has one as Wi-Fi controllable. Um, so I think it is great to dose a single solution like this, right? Or if you need to dose some kind of medicine for your reef tank or your QT tank, or if you want to dose certain like kelp water and stuff like that. So I'll be using this 10 gallon budget built <laughs> uh, as a, almost like a test subject to, for this little dosing pump and the solution and we'll see. And again, all these are just optional. Uh, I'm just doing this because I'm using this almost like my play, uh, like my sandbox, right? Um, you don't need any of these to have a successful reef tank, but it just makes your life easier, I believe. At least, I believe. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Anyways, this has been a uh, way longer than expected, but basically I just wanna get you guys up to speed on what has been happening with this 10 gallon budget built. Everything's stable. I'm just letting it age. Uh, I think things come with time, right? Especially when if you're patient in this hobby, I feel like you have a, a head start in turn versus like trying haphazardly doing a bunch of things at a time. So I've just been letting it age for the last couple months, and I think it's to a point where I'm trying to dial things in now, so it's even more stable and it's more automated. Uh, but of course, this will also increase the budget a little bit. Uh, I just want to re reiterate that these are all not necessary, but these will just make your life a little bit easier. And I'll go a little bit more into it in the in a future video. Um, I hope you enjoyed this one, and if you have any questions, leave a comment. Again, if I cannot answer it, I'm sure somebody will. Until then, I'll see you guys next week. This guy is so annoying. Oh, fuck.